Welcome back to Bumblebee. Top 10 unusual fashion trends in history, part two. two. Ho ho, brother. And coming in at number 10, stiff collars. This early 1900s invention was accidental by nature, but seems absolutely painful just hearing about it. The detachable collar or stiff collar, created by Hannah Montague in New York in 1827, has been coined the father killer. <gasps> Well, this stiff detachable collar is so stiff that men could die from just wearing it. Yeah, basically just rubbing your jugular up against it all day would restrict oxygen to the brain. You could pass out or even die. This man was killed by a collar! So basically your own collar is rear naked choking the shit out of you all day. I thought the tie was the worst part. Made out of usually a separate material to the shirt pinned onto, the removable, starched to absolute hell and back collar basically turns as a sharp and rigid on your neck as a knife. Pain is beauty, darling. Apparently men would fall asleep after a couple of drinks or succumb to a cat nap and sometimes not even wake up at all. Dressed to death, literally. Number nine, mini bowler hats. Ah yes, are you tired of bowler hats fitting on your head properly? Are you stuck in the 1940s and you're now tired of regular sized, properly fitting bowler hats? Well, fear not, old heads. Introducing mini bowler hats. Yep, that right there, that right there is fashion, right there, folks. Take something that's already working and then just jazz it up, you know, just mess it up just a little bit. This look didn't last too long because only a few could pull it off, obviously. The hat wouldn't fit on your head, that was the whole point. A hat that isn't supposed to fit. It was always sideways and like dainty, it was kind of half off. Any swift breeze comes along, good game, the hat's gone. Now you're chasing a mini bowler hat down the road like it's a silent film. Whoa, <laughs> oops, sorry, my hat. Harper's Bazaar deemed the mini bowler hat one of the worst of the 1940s. Yeah, I see a lot of hats now that aren't on all the way. Drives me nuts, I just wanna, just wanna put it on. It's always like about to flap off. I'm like, you're gonna lose it, man. The wind's gonna come, you're gonna lose that hat. It's a nice hat. Number eight, bad teeth. If you've had a couple root canals like me and enjoy the taste and feel of your tongue ripped to shreds after a big old bag of sours, well, then this one's for you. Opposed to the nice, clean, white smile we all strive for today, back then the sight of bad teeth was actually, well, charming. It usually meant you had a lot of money. Ah, those disgusting peasants and their hygiene. <laughs> teeth have a lifespan on their own, and the white discoloration from poor hygiene happens to all of us on its own. But the best method and the fastest method to ensure that those little chompers become stinky and brown, sugar. Which, if you were living anywhere between the 12th and 19th century, was very expensive and really hard to come by. So why the fashion craze? Well, it's got multiple purposes. For instance, in Southeast Asian cultures, blackening one's teeth or the Japanese oha guro was seen as both a beauty standard and a tooth preserver. This process would happen by coating the teeth in a mixture of goop, usually made out of iron, vinegar, and vegetable tannin to dye the teeth black. Queen Elizabeth is a great example of this beauty standard. She would basically just smash a sugar goop into her mouth every day to purposely destroy her teeth. The more infected and discolored the teeth, the better. Ew. Number seven, propeller hats. Okay, I'm coming for hats in this video, it seems. Sorry about that. Propeller hats in Super Mario, very practical. A lot of Goombas, sudden gusts of wind, plus a few warp pipes. You're gonna need a lift or two, right? Fair. The summer of 1947, not that windy, not that windy folks. Not windy enough for propeller hats, I'll tell you that for free. Why are teens in the 40s wearing airport runway anemone eaters on their heads? Why, we don't need to know the wind velocity outside, just go eat some ice cream. Well, it started with a cartoonist named Ray Faraday Nelson. See, he used this propeller hat in a cartoon, and then later on at a sci-fi convention, he had the cartoon there with a real life propeller hat. And everyone was like, what, well, how? How did he just do that? This of course swept the nation just like the fidget spinner. Brands made their own versions, they hopped on the trend quickly. So quick in fact that Nelson never had time to even secure a patent for this new fresh idea. Yeah, it was too late. He didn't get a dime from the hats and we didn't get the gift of solo flight. So let's call it even, right? Number six, ruffs. With silken coats and caps and golden rings, with ruffs and cuffs and farthingales and things. Taming of the Shrew, Act 4, Scene 3. Ah yes, the theater and the rough. Well, not that rough, but quite literally theater in a rough. A rough, I sound like a dog. A rough, or also known as the Elizabethan collar, was an interchangeable piece of cloth that could itself be laundered separately while keeping the wearer's gown from not being soiled at the neckline. Long story short, no chef boy or a spilling out of your mouth and down onto your clothes. 
<laughs> hey, that's a good idea. The stiffness of the garment forced upright posture and poise. Most ruffs could only be worn once due to its longevity and structure. Made out of a very fine material like silk, their light and delicate material, design and size led them to become a symbol of wealth and status amongst the upper class. There was even a time where blue dyed ruffs were against the law in England since it resembled Scotland's colours on its flag. It shall only be of two primary colours, yellow and blood. Oh, red. Red? Red! Number 5. Smoke Break Jackets. Here we go. Hey, remember Hugh Hefner? Yeah, not only did he treat women like sh but he also dressed like it completely. Yeah, rather fitting if you ask me. Guy would wear a stinky maroon colored jacket and then sit there and blow smoke in your face all night. What an icon. Guy changed history. He would wear what's called a smoking jacket. That's what he was... That's what this garbage is. They were around in the 1600s, but they really peaked popularity in the 1920s when Hugh was like 56 years old, you know what I mean? These jackets were designed for gentlemen. I mean, obviously, you know. You know, they were designed as bathrobes with class. They were made of this velvet cloth, perfect for soaking up cigar smoke and further accusations. God rest his soul. He really left his mark in history, didn't he? Number four, corsets. Okay, we know literally everything about these things, but you don't, so listen up. If you have to put your foot in the middle of my back to lace me up, yeah, it's too tight. Or is it? A stiff and rigid piece of clothing that I could definitely use for my posture. The corset, first invented in Italy, then France, then England. The rigid posture and protective garment around the kidneys, ribs, and vital organs under a knight's armor were adopted for style, class, and shape. Most popularized during the 16th century, this slim and sleek look was adored and worn by all classes. The best way for a woman to shape her bust? A man's chest straight and high while riding. And a great way to lose consciousness. No, 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 I can breathe. Go, go a bit tighter. Yeah. Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Usually made out of something strong like whalebone or wood. The stitched corsets would maintain its hard shape and the wearer would basically just be stitched in for the entirety of the day. That sounds comfortable. Number three, hammer pants. Okay, look, Kyle and I were on a dance team or two growing up. We get it. Baggy pants, extra zippers, zippers that don't even have pockets, pockets that are far too shallow to hold even that of a chapstick. We get it, okay? We love a good pair of dance pants. The hammer pants from the 90s, I don't think that was it. We should have heeded MC Hammer's warning and not touched it, you know what I mean? The man turned 60 this year, so we have to now look back on the truth from him. MC Hammer himself has made it very clear. He says, quote, don't call them parachute pants. I detest the term, end quote. Yeah, man of few words, but you know what? When you sing that many songs, you don't need to speak anymore. Obviously, MC Hammer didn't invent this style, but it's funny to see him act like he did. Know what I mean? These types of trousers initially appeared in Persia, India, and Turkey thousands of years ago, but we love your bangers, MC Hammer. All three. Number two, Belladonna Drops. Growing up with bad vision, I've had some pretty weird things shoved into my eyes. Dirty fingers, drops, but never a scoop of berry jam. No, I kind of missed out on that one, I guess. Okay, maybe not jam, but the belladonna berries, though very toxic, had an unusual role in beauty standards in medieval Europe. Upon squishing this doughy-eyed remedy into your sockets, the persons, usually women's eyes, would dilate, resulting in huge, doughy puppy dog eyes, just running around town with blurred vision like you're about to get ophthalmologisted. E, M, L, four, nine, strawberry, raspberry, blueberry, that's not, okay, what, what? Of course, you wouldn't be able to see how good you looked, per se, as if you've ever been dilated for optometrist reasons, then you know exactly what I mean. The belladonna or beautiful woman drops got you running into walls every two seconds, but boy oh boy does she look beautiful. Number one, paper dresses. This short-lived fad was introduced in the 1960s. It was a good one. It was exactly what you think. Paper dresses, nice. Paper Mario in real life, finally. I've always wanted this. I could already feel the paper cuts. Ah, what a nightmare this ought to be. Here we go. Paper dresses to go, go. That was the phrase they like to use. They said the word go twice, therefore must be a good product. The Scott Paper Company made these not expecting the reaction that it got. It caught on quickly, of course. It only took six months for this casual paper company to start selling more than half a million paper dresses. Just out of nowhere, they're like, oh, let's just try this, and then it worked. It went so well that other companies hopped on board, just like the propeller hats. Over $3 million were spent on this awful fad. Andy Warhol was even in on the mix. It was a big deal. Everybody wanted to be involved. They weren't made of flimsy printer paper. It wasn't as bad as I'm making it sound, but it certainly wasn't great either. 
The dress was made of disposable material called Duraweave. You know, before it was cool to make things out of disposable materials. Believe it or not, it was slightly water and slightly fire resistant. Unlike those puffy middle-aged dresses that immediately go woom and then they don't exist anymore. This one was a little bit better. It was took the flame a little bit of time, right? It's been compared to the thick paper bib that you get at the dentist. Yeah, you know that horrible material that bunches up and pokes your neck mid root canal while Kyle's doing stuff? It's made of that. Fun, we love history. We love beautiful fashion history. Where'd you get those? Those are really nice. It's fashion. <laughs> I wouldn't know. But you would now that you've watched that video. Those are the top 10 unusual fashion trends in history part two. Kyle has a voice crack somewhere in the video. Comment down below what the time code is. I've been Kyle McWaters. And I'm Taylor McWaters. We'll see you next time. On Bumblebee. On Bumblebee. I Don't, you're yelling, man. You're screaming. Oh. You guys didn't know where he's going. Where are you going? He's gonna walk into the lights like he's a moth. Uh, e L M 47 Jam Strawberries Raspberry. Sorry, what was that? I'll do it again. It's terrible.